right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine in Pipeline or CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Aaron Hartman, who is over just outside Richmond in Virginia. How are you doing, Dr. Hartman? Doing well on yourself. No, oh, doing great. And, uh, and Aaron started Richmond Integrative um, and Functional Medicine in order to provide access to advanced integrative and functional medic medicine evaluations and treatments to patients in the greater Richmond area and as well by telemedicine. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today is just the future of the medical practice. Uh, so, uh, so Aaron, what changes do you see in, in, the, in the future of the medical? Because let's say medical practices have not changed that much over many years. I mean, the, the way they're set up, um, you know, they're pretty much, you go to one medical practice, you go to another medical practice. It's really the doctors that are different, not so much as how they operate. Yeah, I mean, I, John, I actually, you actually agree with that. The way my grandfather went to a doctor back in the 50s and 60s is basically the same system we're using now. And so what we're seeing is with the reimbursement system, the, the payers, the big payers, big companies, uh, Medicare, CMS are asking for value. And so they're using the same old system to create value via um, quality metrics. Hey, do I ask these questions, et cetera, et cetera, which is going in one direction. And the actual science of medicine, which is basically systems analysis, um, root cause analysis is going in a different direction. And so what's happening is the people that are trying to practice to keep up with it are, are stuck in the, in between the industry and the science. And so one of the things that's happening is people are jumping ship and doing direct primary care, which is where you kind of don't even accept insurance and you have a you know monthly fee membership models that are kind of con shares cash based. But one of the underlying ideas is you have a micro practice where you minimize overhead. People don't realize that 25% of my overhead is just to deal with insurance companies. So if sure. I can get rid of insurance, I can all of a sudden, I can get like a small clinic, low overhead, all of a sudden I can, I can for the same cost or the same reimbursement, depending on how you look at it, I can create more value because people get more time. And then the problem with current medicine is that it requires cognitive work, which makes time. It takes time to think about patients. The system pays for procedures. And so we have a system driving procedures when we need is, need is cognitive time. And so that's where the micro practice kind of falls into that niche. Yeah, no, it, it's fascinating because I do think that's one of the things that you know, people feel like when they often go to, you know, go to the, uh, go to a medical practice, you know, they're kind of, it's almost like a conveyor belt you're in, you get a couple of minutes with the doctor and you're out again. Uh, and to your point, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, given the fact that there's so much mind body connection and everything in medicine, that, that, that we have totally separated that in traditional models. I mean, the, the the reimbursement system is based on procedures. So I give the analogy I give people back when we still went to the hospital, I'd walk across the street, go in the hospital, see someone in the ICU, um, talk with the pulmonary critical care specialist, talk with the surgeon, look at their vent, come across, get phone calls from the nurses. I got paid $82 for all that time as a medical doctor. You know, now if you came to my office and I did a skin biopsy on you, mm -hmm. I would get paid about $180 for that. And that take three to five minutes of my time. And it's just like, our system is not geared towards people using their brain and thinking. It's geared towards three to five minutes, what's your diagnosis? And now you go down this procedure conveyor belt, which um, is great for the industry of medicine, but not for individuals in the practice of medicine. Yeah, so um, so talk to me a little bit more about how, uh, how a micro practice would, would function very differently from uh, a normal larger practice. I mean, first of all, the micro practice, you wouldn't be working with insurance companies. So you wouldn't have, right. there would not be someone between you and the patient be, you're paying me to see me. And we kind of figure out that schema, but because of that, and because it's a smaller practice, now all of a sudden overheads less, you'd use more technology. So people actually would go online, sign up for their own appointments. They would um, send you messages through a portal. So using mm -hmm. more technology, um, which streamlines the whole workflow. Um, and then the actual practice itself, you would just kind of farm out lab x-ray those kind of things to make to keep your overhead as low as possible but then, then but then all of a sudden then you can spend 30 minutes with the patient 45 minutes with the patient you know and it, there's no pressure to see someone in every seven to ten minutes which is a typical pressure on a standard you know primary care you need to see you know five to six people an hour versus now you can see three two and a half to three people an hour and make the same amount of income 
Yeah, and, and what's great about that, as you said, is being able to spend the quality time with people, because I think that is, I think that's, and especially after the pandemic and all of that, I think that's people crave having better insight, deeper conversations, regardless of, of what who they're interacting with. But certainly when it comes to, to doctors and, and medical issues, I think people crave a little bit of a deeper dive than they're getting today. And, and I think the marketing is part of that because people think, okay, well, time is concierge. It's, it's, it's soft frou-frou stuff, but it's like, well, if you come in with a headache and I want to figure out if your headache is from you know, your sleep apnea or your headache is from um, your uncontrolled diabetes or if your headache is from your food allergies or the mold in your house, it's going to take me time to investigate where do you live? What are you doing? What's your, what's your, your sleeping others say about your sleeping habits. And you can't do that in 10 minutes. It takes time to go through those things. And that's where all the new data our new understanding about how the mind, the body connect and the body and the mind with the environment. It takes a very educated practitioner that can actually talk with you. And that takes ultimately time. Mm -hmm. And so why, why has that been um, traditionally so separated? Uh, you know, the fact that if I, I go to the doctor for physical, you know, ailments or whatever, but if it comes to, if it comes to anything with the mind or mental, like I go somewhere else and the rarely is there communication between the two, but as we know, they're, they're totally connected. Well, I think a part of the issue is the science of medicine leads the practice of medicine, maybe 20 to 30 years. So you might get a new insight on the gut and how the gut affects mental health and how mental health affects cortisol, which affects autoimmune issues. And we can talk about this all day long, but mm -hmm. the actual, to get into the practice of the standard of care, evidence-based medicine is a term people use, that's a decades long process. And so that's where, and as the science gets more and more, and we have an acceleration of data, not a deceleration, we have the same old rudimentary payment system that we're kind of stuck in. And so that's where we're having more and more people like me jump ship start a new business model, you know, whether it's um, pay, fee for service, pay for service, micro practice, you know, um, direct primary care, whatever. And then a lot of the big payers are realizing this is where the value is because these people are actually saving future hospitalizations, preventing future deterioration. But the problem again, is that with that, it takes time to see those return on investments years. And most of these big companies are looking at quarterly and annual reports. And so the kind of medicine I'm doing, which is, you know, lots of labs and other things on the front end, but you save hospitalizations, they don't see that for years. And so they don't, it's not valued the same. Yeah, no, no, I can see that. I can see how the, the, the system maybe is, uh, obviously doesn't support this really, you know, uh, quite yet. Um, so, so what, um, so apart from, you know, spending more time and going deeper, uh, et cetera, what are some of the other advantages of, of a micro practice? I guess there's part of it is, is just the, the personal piece is there where you feel like personally connected in a way you, yeah, you may visit your doctor at a practice, but you're probably seen by two or three different assistants yeah. over time. Well, you had, there's more ownership. Like the, the current model is getting away from practitioner ownership into corporate ownership. And the reality is if I feel John, like you, like you belong to me, I know it's mm -hmm. a paternalistic viewpoint, but I think about you at night, I'm thinking like, what's wrong. Something didn't feel quite right. And so that people want that degree of ownership. They want their doctor provider to be thinking about them if things aren't right. And our system, you know, again, it's not quite set up for that. The other thing about it is like a lot of advanced testing, you know, Cleveland Heart Labs looking for advanced heart testing, Geneva Diagnostics looking at advanced organic acid testing, you know, Jewish Nationals doing the advanced testing for mold illness. Like in order to access all those, you need someone who has the time to interpret the labs. It's not just time to talk to you, but to get these labs back and spend 30, 45 minutes mulling over your labs, looking at your chart. And again, that's, brain work that's not paid for by our current model yeah no i i, I totally agree because i mean we, we all do lab work on a fairly <laughs> regular basis especially at this age and you're right it's like it's 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 a bit of a cursory examination of yeah. it unless something <clears throat> unless something is leaping off the page but to your to the point you had earlier like i i i had some um shoulder injury from martial arts and i'd go to a uh, a korean acupuncturist now but he doesn't just treat the acupuncture he's done my um, you know, he takes all pulse stuff, he's done diet, he's done all these other things surrounding it because it's a it's an integrated, just like you talk yeah. about, it's an it's an integrated approach. Yeah, I mean, and that's then there's different types of integrated practitioners, acupuncturists, chiropractors. I'm a medical doctor and kind of mm -hmm. delve into things. And that team approach, you know, the medical system once they say integrative, and they say integrated mess, they mean the cardiologist talks to the rheumatologist, but our current system, no one's talking, they're all sending emails and, and 
charted notes that are 10 pages of insurance information and like three lines of data. And we're being buried in useless administrative paperwork. And we're not getting to the, the, the business of caring for people, which is what we all got into this for. Yeah. And, and obviously, uh, your insurance companies, you know, that, that brings its own level of, of stress as well. Well, I mean, I, I've had insurance companies literally send me a letter saying, if you don't cease and desist from ordering out of network labs, we're going to drop you from our insurance. And it's like, well, I talk about that talk with you and you, and you want me to do this advanced stool testing because you've read about gut health, affecting brain health, affecting cardiovascular health. And you've got family history of Alzheimer's. And we now know that gut health, you know, these neurodegenerative just processes start in your gut. Let's do this $300 test. Your insurance says we can't do it. And so I've now gotten the point now I'm going around that and just saying, if you want it, you pay cash only don't, don't involve your insurance because now my name is on it. And if mm -hmm. I get my name on there a few more times, they're going to drop me from that. And now, you know, you know, a doctor without insurance is basically a, an underpaid hole digger, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so what other, uh, what other changes do you see ahead for, for healthcare? Because I have a feeling with the, the, the types of practices that, you, that you're starting here, I feel like, you know, that's, that's going to gain legs. And I think other people are going to find other niches. Well, I think, you know, one of the, you know, one of the sayings is the doctor, the future is the patient. And what that's saying is, is that you know, with personal devices, with, you know, I got my aura ring right here with these devices, you get data, you can measure your temperature, your heart rate variability, you can measure your, um, your, um, um, your metabolic equivalents, your sleep cycle, all this is tons of data. And so what's happening is individuals that are educated are taking more active, proactive care, but then you get into like, well, how do you interpret that data? And you need someone that can come alongside you and say, you got your CGM monitor, right? That's looking at your sugars. You're, you're checking your ketones to, for your, to train for whatever you're doing. How do you interpret that? And the, that's when you need someone like me who like literally this is our bread and butter to come alongside you. And now we're taking those other individuals like yourself who have these devices. Hey, now you can measure. And when you get sick, you can know you're getting sick two to three days before because your basal body temperature changes at night. Yeah, you know, and it's it's fascinating because as as the technologies advance and the micro technologies, and as you said, like all the the personal devices and home devices that you have, it's like it's great to be that informed. But to your point, is I can gather all that information, but I don't really know what to do with it. And, and that's when you need someone who knows. Okay, great. Yeah. Like your heart rate availability has gone down. When did you eat your last meal? Okay, relate to that. I can be, I've been able to look at my data and be like, you know, if I eat something within two hours, like last night, for example. I only slept uh, seven hours and 20 minutes because I went to bed a little late, but I didn't eat anything before I went to bed. So I had um, six hours and about 49 minutes of actual sleep. And I was actually, I got my rim and got all my deep sleep, even though I had less time because I didn't eat two hours before I went to bed. And I've learned that by having the data and knowing information. So someone like you, who's like, wants to be optimally well, you need mm -hmm. not just the data, but something to help you interpret it and then apply it to yourself. Yeah, and and then and then it's uh, and then it it kind of starts to change from like the reactive, like you know, the doctor going to the doctor when you know you have to and you're sick yeah. or whatever, and then we fix it and move on. This is more about being a little more proactive, and then also looking at what what alterations or changes you need to make in your lifestyle in order to be at optimum optimal health. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's what functional, med, like these practice like mine, functional medicine, they're looking at optimizing your systems. And if I wait for your sugar to be so high that the endocrinologist says you have diabetes, you already had elevated sugar for eight to 10 years before that. Okay, well, what about those eight to 10 years? You had disease, you had increased risk for problems. You come to me, I look at your A1C, I look at your fasting sugars. You know, a normal fasting sugar is actually 75 or less. That you have no mm -hmm. risk for heart disease, no risk for Alzheimer's, no risk for neurological issues. I want my fasting sugar there. I don't want it in 100, but in the standard current model of practice, 100 is fine. Don't worry about it. You know, being proactive is, is the, the way to prevent interactions with the healthcare in the future. And this kind of medicine focuses on that. Yeah. And, uh, and how have you found, like, uh, when, you, when you have patients in this, in this newer form of practice, like, what has what their reaction been coming from traditional medicine to, you know, a traditional practice maybe to what you're doing? Well, in my practice is probably different from different practices, like in California. I feel like in the West Coast, there's more consciousness of this. So I get a lot of patients in the East Coast coming to see me who don't quite understand what I do, who just think I'm a, I deal with chronic health issues and don't understand the labs they're going to do and don't understand how they have to change their lifestyle and how they have to look at their house and their environment. And so a lot of it's just educating people actually what I do. 
but I think that's specific to where I live. You know, um, I've, one of the data points I was looking at two years ago was a third of all functional practitioners were on the West Coast. So I feel like there's more of a consciousness on, on that side of the country that, hey, there's alternatives. So I'm still kind of in the um, educating patients what I do. They, they like it. They're cool. I've got a waiting list of like four to five months. People just want to see me, but it's still actually, what do I actually do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there, there probably is, is more here, but I mean, there still is a preponderance of very traditional, very corporate, uh, big medical groups, oh. which, which is the norm, um, t- to be honest. And then and once you, once you introduce your, your new patients to what you're doing, and once they start to understand it, I mean, what's some of the feedback that you get? They, they're usually really excited. They really, I hear the biggest thing is people, well, the first thing is people are overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed. Like, wow, these are all these things affecting my health and how much I have to change and how come no one else told me that. And then after we work through that kind of initial, like shock and all, and, Mm -hmm. you know, um, like denial, we kind of get into like, this is really cool. I can actually change the future trajectory of my health. And they get really excited, but it's, it's a struggle because it's going against our societal norms about what diet's supposed to look like, about how you spend your time, use of computer technology. Um, you know, how do you just, our society is driven for people to, to be stressed all the time. And here's an interesting statistic. Stress by itself is a bigger risk factor for heart disease than your cholesterol. Wow. When's the, when's the wow. last time you, when's the last time your cardiologist said, forget your cholesterol. <laughs> how's your stress, John, what's your, how are you stressed right now? You know, that's a bigger predictor for heart disease than, um, your actual total cholesterol number. And, and that blows people's minds. And how do we, how do we delve into that? That's, that takes time. And that's where relationship and getting to know someone. A lot of my patients I'm going to see for years, cause they, it just takes a while to like process all this. Yeah, no, I'm not, I could see that you're correct. I mean, our, our, <clears throat> our society is set up for stress. Work is set up for stress. In fact, in some ways there, it's almost like a cultural norm that if you're not stressed, then you're not working hard enough. You're not if you're, contributing. If you're not, if you're not busy and your Facebook and Instagram don't look like you're busy, you're not contributing. You're not, you're, <laughs> your, your life has no value. It's like, you know what? I want to look like I'm relaxing. I'm a great time. Not stressed all the yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. That's my goal. Absolutely. Well, um, listen, uh, Dr. Hartman, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Dr. Hartman's information is going to be below this video and links to, to his site. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Well, I'm an integrated functional medicine practitioner that works with complex care patients to maximize their health. Um, my story started with my daughter and adopting my adopting her and my family. I've just learned that optimal health and wellness can be within reach of people that are motivated, educated, and um, given the right tools. And that's that's what I do. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I really look forward to seeing how these uh, unfold because I think definitely the whole medical industry is is due an overhaul. We yeah. need to move out of those old yeah. style models and we need to get to a more integrative approach. So listen, thank you again, uh, Dr. Hartman. Thank you for watching and listening and I'll see you all again soon. All right. Take care. Bye.